Welcome to Launch Code, a premier business podcast, starring Evan Hafer, Matt Best, and Jared Taylor. All right, welcome to Launch Code Podcast with Evan Hafer, Baker. Oh, shit, I've had a lot of caffeine. Evan Hafer, Baker Levitt, and Jack Carr today. That is our guest for the Launch Code Podcast. So, Jack, uh, if I can call you that, is that you professionally acceptable? You may. Okay. Um, Jack's got an interesting background, and uh, this is two launch codes in a row. Actually, this is about three in a row because we had Rut, we had Rutherford on, Jacko, and now Jack Carr, Navy SEAL number three. We've probably had more, but um, yeah. So tell us a little bit about yourself, uh, Jack. First and foremost, it's The Terminal List. That's your book. That is. Um, and I wanted to get you on here for a combination of reasons because you're a veteran that has written a... Could you define it as a success at this point? You I think so. Right? Yeah, yeah, success. It's, doing, uh, it's exceeding expectations on all fronts, which is always a good thing. That is a good thing. So tell us a little bit about yourself. Where are you from? What did you do in the military? When did you transition that whole night? Yeah, so just... Uh, Quick background mm-hmm. is uh, there are two things that I wanted to do with my life from a very early age, and one of those was to serve my country in uniform as a Navy SEAL as soon as I found out what they were when I was seven years old. Wow. Yeah, and uh, I can go back and talk about a little bit about that, but uh, the other thing was to write fiction in this genre, and then I always knew that uh, the SEAL thing had to come first right. just by default, and as I was getting out, of the, getting out of the SEAL teams during that last year, I said, okay, it's time to pursue that other dream, because if I don't do it now, I don't want to look back when I'm 80 years old, 85 years old on my deathbed and say, man, I wonder what would have happened had I given that other dream a shot. Right. So I uh, started writing this book and I always wanted to write political military thrillers and got this to the right person in New York who happened to, to love it. And next thing you know, off we go to the races. Well, it's interesting because you and I had the exact two dreams and I missed them both because I didn't become a Navy SEAL and I haven't written a book. So there's still time. I've got to have some kind of corrective. <laughs> I think you're doing okay though. You make great coffee. Uh, make no. great coffee. I had, I had two, you know, two dreams, which was uh, become a Green Beret and eventually be a coffee roaster. So, you know, cheers to that, man. Cheers. You know, look at that. Cheers. And you make great coffee. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Very uh, powerful. Wh- how yeah. old were you when you said you decided that you wanted to be a science fiction writer? <laughs> so, uh, not science fiction, but uh, I wanted to do that from a very early age. My mom was a librarian, um, so I'll skip back to uh, the military side. Is your and, is your mom still? Is she yep, still around? Still, still a librarian. Yeah, wow. and uh, that's how I that's how I found out about seals very very early on, and how we were able to do some research back in the early '80s because with no internet, there was not much information out there. There was a, a few mentions in a couple books here and there, and a couple magazine articles, but without a mom that was a librarian that knew how to use the Dewey Decimal System right. and do some research, it was uh, it would be hard to. Which find ones out were you reading when you were a kid? Because I read a bunch of them too. I right. talked to Jocko about it. Actually. Actually. Okay, so uh, I'll start with the how I found out about them right. first. So that's the movie The Frogman. And okay. And I think that was uh, from the 50s or something, but it was uh, back in the day, there was only a couple channels on TV. So on the weekends when my dad was watching football, I had two minutes for a commercial break to flip to the other station and watch a war movie and then run back, flip it back to football, watch that for however long that wow. took. Then a commercial would come up. My dad would look at his watch again and say, go. And I'd run up and flip it to the war movie playing, uh, playing opposite football on Sunday. And uh, saw this movie with these guys coming up over the beach and blowing up obstacles. In advance it was a of conventional legit movie. It wasn't like yeah, a it's called the Frogman. Yeah, the legit okay. movie, old school movie, black and white. And uh, I asked my dad, "Hey, who are these guys?" And he said, uh, very knowingly, "Those are the those are the, fro- the Frogmen," because that was the name of the movie. Right. Good work, Dad. And uh, <laughs> I said, "Hey, how? Uh, you know, what are what are Frogmen? That looks pretty cool." And uh, football was on back on by that point, so he said, "Go ask your mother." <laughs> <laughs> so I did. And uh, mom said, let's go to the library. Any opportunity to get us kids to the library, she took it. So off we went to the library and did some research and uh, found a couple mentions in a couple of different books. There was a magazine called uh, Gung Ho Magazine that uh, that came out. It was only, I don't know how long that that's was out there for. a different publication. Now, now that's out of... Uh well, evidently, L.A. Baker. Is it still around for real? No, I'm just joking. <laughs> so there was a, a mention in there. Um, there was actually a VHS tape that uh, showed seals in Vietnam, 
and had these guys with the stoner machine guns just rocking it. Documentary. And documentary. Okay. Yep. Yep. So that was out there. Um, and then I read a book called Brotherhood of the Rose. And uh, that was by a guy named David Morrell, uh, who's still writing today. He's an amazing guy. He's become a great friend. And he actually created the character Rambo back in 1973 oh, wow. okay. with First Blood. Wow. Um, but his book Brotherhood of the Rose uh, isn't about SEALs. Um, actually, the main protagonists are former, former SF guys. But he mentioned SEALs in there and what he said about them kind of cemented uh in my head like okay i've seen right. this movie the frogman i've seen this vhs tape with these right. guys blasting away with the stoner uh david morell is mentioning it in this book called brotherhood of the rose i'm in so they had me from a very very early age no uh, no oh. uh, external influences from like some old copies of like soldier of fortune i think I, I had not discovered soldier of fortune then but i did soon thereafter there you um, go and uh, so, yeah, I had, <laughs> I don't think they even publish that anymore. I think it's all online now, right? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. <clears throat> I knew a couple of writers from that, guys that I knew. But uh, so I, when I was in high school, I read a couple of books on the Navy SEALs. One was Good to Go. Yeah, I read, read that. that one. I don't think I read that one. I Point did. Man was one of yeah. them around that time frame, early 90s, I think. They, I read like I, several, but the one that I really remember was uh, Good to Go. And they talked a lot about the Phoenix program and that. Oh one. yeah. And then, um, you know, probably stuff that you shouldn't have been reading at that age, like really shouldn't have. Like it went into like graphic detail, about, right? Like knifing dudes on a trail, like sticking this oh, dagger yeah. up through the undercarriage of their Great ribs stuff. so you could hit their heart, and like, I'm like 15, just going, yeah, it's badass. And yeah. No, no, absolutely. I can only yeah. imagine if they had the internet back then. Oh us. yeah, I would have been watching all kinds of weird shit. Yeah, we should, none of which would have been good for a 15 year old. So you're indoctrinating yourself. Yeah. Yeah, but I think it, to your point there that uh, kids in that that age, let's say, let's say fourth grade, fifth mm -hmm. grade, sixth grade, seventh grade, eighth grade, early high school years, like need need heroes. Yeah, and you. Uh, you know, for us, we found them in those those pages of some of the nonfiction books, and then for me in some of the, the fictional ones, because I also started reading books by David Morrell, by Nelson DeMille, uh, J.C. Pollock, A.J. Quinnell, like all these guys in the 80s. That, Did you read uh, those Mac Bolan books? Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I, there's, yeah, there, there might be some Mac Bolan influence on the pages yeah, of the terminal list for those ass. out there that uh, remember Mac Bolan. <laughs> uh, he's still probably going strong, is my probably. guess. Probably. Yeah. I used to love... The loadout when he in a Mac Bullen book, he used to have these like loadouts and he would list all the guns. Oh, yeah. And all the, the full the full meal deal. And oh, I was yeah. like, this is so legit. I haven't I haven't said this publicly before, but right. I was a member of the Mac Bolin fan club. What? Yeah, there was such a thing. And every <laughs> month you'd get your books. You'd get a Mac oh. Bolin book, maybe two. You'd get Phoenix Force. You'd get Able Team. Wow. All in a, a little box. It would, uh, yeah, it distressed my mother to no end because she's a librarian <laughs> and wanted me reading other things. Right. Uh, she eventually threw them all out, actually. I had all my Mac Bolins just ended up uh, probably in the trash. When you, went, um, when you went off to the military or before? Before, okay. yeah, yeah. One, was she like mad at you or something? Or? No, I just think uh, that uh, she took one summer of me being away and took the opportunity to to clean my shelves of uh, all things that didn't meet her <laughs> standard, uh, of which the Mac Bowen books right. <laughs> made up quite a few. Yeah, I I could I, I know that because I had a bookshelf full of just trash. Too. <laughs> like just I wouldn't classify them as trash. Definitely not for a sixth grader. Because no, no, they're great. Any any opportunity you can get a sixth grader to read on their own, I think you're doing, you're winning, right? Oh, well, you're, remember he, you're winning. I mean, we all remember Mac Bowen and his Desert Eagle 50 Oh, cal. yeah. He oh, loved yeah. that one. <laughs> yeah. he loved, I think he loved the Mac 10. Those were his two yeah. go-tos. Yeah. No, he liked the, uh, there was a, um, God, he liked the M79, so the grenade launcher. Who doesn't? That was, that's yeah. legit. And then he had, he had this smaller version of that 40 millimeter. I think they had a smaller version with a rotating, uh, with a rotating drum, like early, early on. In I the think 80s. it made the cover of a it few. It did. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. You no, know it's what all I'm good saying. stuff. I know. Yeah. 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 No, I was all, all about yeah. it. Um, I still remember a couple of my favorites, actually, were the ones I like the ones where he went on vacation. And even though he was on vacation, something happened. Like so, he was out there by himself in the wilderness, and then he gets attacked by Spetsnaz or something yeah. like that on a river in Utah, in, in Utah or Idaho. So Idaho. good. It's well, great that's, stuff. That's like so MacGyver. Good. Like yeah. that guy didn't, yeah. he didn't go a day in life without getting some shit, you know? No, he's yeah. not getting a break. Didn't get a break. You're not going to. But the yeah. funny thing you mentioned, like your mom threw books away. The one publication that no mother will ever throw away is National Geographic. Oh, no. Yeah. My mother has, I'm not shitting, 30 years of National oh, wow, Geographic. Really? Oh, yeah. 
Oh, no, yeah. we just talked about that the other day because once I, I a friend stopped by from the SEAL teams on his way back to San Diego, and uh, just two nights ago, and when I was deployed once, we moved. I planned all my deployments around moving, and uh, so my wife was gonna have to do it by herself. So he stopped by and moved all my books. Uh, and I've been collecting books for a long time oh, and they wow. included those National Geographic's that my mom did not throw away And so he got to load all those up and drive them across Coronado and in National Geographic is also your average man's first exposure to pornography <laughs> First time <laughs> you saw a boobie nor deny Yeah, I can't remember. I know that that wasn't a thing though where I was looking at it going. Yeah, that's 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 attractive No, I didn't say attractive. Yeah. I just said hey, there's a boob. Yeah, there is Yeah yeah. Okay. So now that Baker's completely ruined the conversation. Um, <laughs> so when did you graduate from high school? So uh, 91. Okay. High school. Did you go straight and, into the uh, Navy? No, when I did, uh, I wanted to do college first, so I'd have okay. a backup because of my right. research. Um, you know, I, I didn't pay attention to exactly what the attrition rate was, which hovers around 80%, give or take, for, right. for buds. Um, and of course, I thought I'll be in that 20% mm -hmm. that, that makes it. But I also knew the importance of contingency plans. So uh, I said, hey, just in case, um, I'm going to go to college first and, right. and have, a, have a little bit of a backup. So I did that first. Um, and it also allowed me to keep training. And because right. back then you didn't really, there was no, there's nothing out there on the inter internet about secret. There was no internet. So you couldn't really right. do any research other than, hey, 80% of people don't make it. This is really hard. I've seen people on the obstacle course and I've seen some guys coming out of the surf zone and you know, that was about it. So yeah. all you had to do for training was, I guess I need to be as tough as possible. So right. did a lot of boxing, got into jujitsu very early in the oh, early nineties. Wow. Uh, I've since stopped since I'm going to be probably getting spine surgery here in the next uh, couple of yeah. weeks uh, again. But uh, so I did all that stuff earlier on and just trained right. and trained and just, was, I was solely focused on getting to the SEAL teams, getting through buds, getting to the, getting to my first SEAL team. And then I thought it was going to be all secret missions as soon as I, as soon as I showed up and so that was 1997. I showed up with my first SEAL team, and okay. it was time to uh, clean the bathroom, paint the wall, change the light bulbs, <laughs> so, do new guy stuff. Yeah, so, got to F do that for a while. Yeah, that's it. That's so, what's it. your degree in? Uh, criminology. Okay. So I just wanted something that would get me through college as quickly as possible right. and get me to the SEAL team. So, nice. let um, me ask you this: but, um, Looking back on it, you know, uh, most SEALs have the same answer. But like, what was the hardest part for you for buds? And I mean, in the moment, like when you were going through something, there had to be a time that was really, really tough for you. Like what was the hardest, hardest part for you? Yeah. You know, it, it sounds weird, but, uh, and I'll, I'll give you two. So the one that I always think about is having to take your boots on and off all the time all for all these different evolutions and get them back on. Like I just hated taking my boots on and off. So I was been strictly a flip flop guy ever since, but, uh, Evan, just taking Evan. the boots on and off for all those different evolutions while you're getting yelled at to hurry up. Um, so I hated that, but as far as physical slash mental, it was, uh, the swims uh, uh, initially anyway, because I didn't know that stroke, that underwater recovery stroke. Right. And now we teach guys. Now we give them a whole bunch of training when they leave boot camp and they go and they get classes on nutrition, on mindset, how to work out with the logs, how to carry the boats, like all this stuff. So they're the most prepared physically and mentally you could possibly be when you showed up, show up for buds now. Right. Uh, well, we didn't have any of that. So right. uh, learning that stroke was tough for me. So I went from, I think, second to last on our first swim. Uh, and then I just struggled and struggled and struggled until somebody that had been uh, a water polo uh, player in college took me aside, taught me the stroke and, from my class, not from, not from the right. instructor staff. And then I went from second to last to second. Wow. So uh, learning that technique, that was tough. And then so we're worried about, oh, man, I'm a, I'm a good swimmer. How can I not figure out this dang stroke? That's right. pretty impressive going from second to last to second in, in swimming, which is, you know, I think is a skill that you have to develop over time. Like, I don't think people just jump. Oh, he's a natural swimmer. He's never swam before. But look, this guy can really do it. That's, that's, that's actually really cool. And so it's a multiple swim. So I might be exaggerating. It might be on one of those swims. I was second, but I'm, I'm uh, airing up. So right. anyway, I went from almost last uh, in the top. Yeah, that's awesome. So, but, uh, but learning that technique was so helpful. And that's why we have uh, fitter quitters today. We call them because we spend, what are those? So we spend millions of dollars getting these guys uh, ready to go to buds now, instead of just baptism by fire, right. kicking them into there. Like, like when I went through, so now they get all this training before they show up and we still get that, uh, 80% attrition. You know, that's super interesting, right? Where you, you're still having the same attrition rate, but they haven't met through a crucible yet. Yeah. So that's the crucible right there. And hell yeah. week is where most of those come from. Well, yeah, because it's about the same attrition rate across the board, actually, I think as far as the, uh, special operations, 
is, is, is looked at. I, I remember talking to a use of sock psychologist that had kind of spent time and everybody and everybody has their own, their own thing, you know, like ours is like in the woods at night carrying a rucksack and you're by yourself, Robin Sage. You're, you're by yourself, you know, it's like a star course and it's team events and you're putting tons of weight on your back and you're like humping through the sand and you graded on how well you contribute to your team. Same shit. Right. Yeah. And then, but the whole thing, you know, is a year and a half. So that that's a grind or two years, depending on whether or not you go to the, the medical course and right. then you got like Sage, which Sage is a whole other animal. And I remember guys had been in the course for like a year and a half getting dropped in Sage and you're just like, Oh my God, it's so brutal. fucking brutal, yeah. dude. It's just brutal. <sighs> like you failed your patrol and you're like, is that right at the end? Yeah, dude. Okay. That's a, that was the last like twenty some days at the very end. And Interesting. like, so you'd already gone through everything. So you went through selection. You went through phase one. At that time, there was like phase one, phase two, and then phase three was Sage. That was the last thing you had to do before you went to language okay. school. Was Sage tough? Uh, there were uh, not aspects. For, not for you in general, I mean, but in, in, is it regarded as a tough test? Yeah, I mean, I remember at times. I mean, we had, I did like a 36 hour infill with, I was carrying 15 pounds less than my body weight for 36 hours. It was fucking a grind. And I remember a guy literally quitting on infill cause it was fucking brutal. Like you're like humping 135 pounds through the mountains of North Carolina. It's like pissing rain the entire time. You're jackhammering from, you know, lack of like calories and you know, we'd have like what we call the honorable quits that are like guys that are like rolling their ankles or whatever and it's uh, like dude you still got to carry the weight like medevac ain't coming i like, oh. still got to go but <laughs> you can quit in an hour man. yeah yeah you i always quit. like that i always like seeing the guys i mean it's, it sounds terrible to say maybe we could edit this out later no but uh i always liked seeing the guys quit oh so when i was I. in there because yeah. i thought this is this is the program working mm -hmm. this guy should not be here so a lot of people in class would always yell out hey come back come back if they're leaving the surf zone during hell oh, week to go God, ring no. the bell which we put in the uh, trailer hitch of a truck that's yeah. always visible so for that entire hell week that whole five days you see the bell because the rest of the course it's over by the first phase right. office and you have to like run to it from wherever you are to quit but in hell week <laughs> we make it quite easy to just stand up and quit it because it's right there with you the whole time i thought that that was i i called that the vampire effect so that's what i i actually coined that and like it was like it would give you a new life to see people quit it's like and take their energy yeah take their you life could force. steal their energy so i'd yeah. look for it and, and then it. you'd like look for it and be like Dog, you got to roll out, man. Like, you're not, you're not <laughs> so doing so good. So I didn't take it to that extreme. I wouldn't actually talk people into quitting, but I wouldn't try yeah. to bring them back. Chris Irwin told me a story. There was a guy in his buds class that like would claim like eight confirmed kills. He'd be like, hey, man, let's get the fuck out of here. And the guys would be like, yeah, man, I'm with you. And they'd go like take him off to ring the bell, and he'd like whip around and just run back. And the guy <laughs> Some story Irwin told me about. That's funny. But, um, That's super funny. Yeah. <laughs> but um, it wasn't him. It was someone in his class. But uh, John Timor, who's, uh, who's running Kill Cliff now, I was with him in Atlanta Thursday, and he told me, I asked him that same question I just asked you, and he said the hardest, the uh, closest he ever, like, in a, closest, the biggest battle he ever had with himself was, um, I think he said it was, and I'll probably butcher this, but it was like the third night of Hell Week where you guys, like, go to the chow hall, and you have, like, an hour, you know, to get, like, your coffee, your food, and all that stuff, and he was like, you know, man, it's like, you know, and then you have to, someone's on watch on the boat. So there's like three boats or whatever, and there's someone stands watch for 20 minutes at a time. Yep. And he said that the guy, so the two guys came out to relieve the other guys. And there was this ambulance parked like right in front of the, the boats. And they kept going like hot coffee, warm donuts. And oh, they yeah. kept saying it. But the guy that was supposed to relieve him quit during chow <laughs> so, he just, so he's just standing, standing there, there. Yeah. yeah and then finally he said he like threw his paddle down and ran over to the window and just started like beating on it and like someone realized like oh yeah other sea or whatever he said i was like shit someone go relief team on so he's like i only had like 20 minutes to eat but he said that was the, that was the thing that almost got him was they kept going hot coffee warm donuts oh yeah just out of a speaker like right into his face yep oh yeah they don't they make it quite easy to self-select out of the program which is uh part of the part of the genius of it and why we get such yeah. a uh, you know a high caliber guy coming out the other end of the process but you, you mentioned uh, fitter quitters so um john welburn and i went and visited the air force who john welburn oh okay the air force special operations training thing at what is it lackland or whatever the air force base over sure. here and um they were talking about fitter quitters 
Huh. And I, I, you know, I was like, well, you know, if you kind of look at it in a positive light, I don't see any downside to having dudes that are in be- much better shape, more knowledgeable on food, nutrition and stuff, and have been through something pretty tough going back out into the fleet. And hopefully some of that rubs off on to, you know, some of the other guys. And he was like, yeah, that's one way we look at it. But um, they went on about that at, uh, at length because they can get them ready physically, nutrition, recovery, all that stuff, sleep, everything, monitor their vitals, everything. But the one thing that they'll never be able to test and will never change is that mental strength. And correct me if I'm wrong, the majority of what you guys made it through was based on mental strength. I mean, yeah, that's really what we're trying to trying to find is, is that person that has that mental fortitude uh, to, to never quit, keep driving forward, just like in life. Yeah. Um, so when somebody quits, so later I was on the other side of that is the OPSO getting ready to leave the military. And that bell by the first phase office was right by my office at Bud. So I got to see everybody that would come up, stand by that bell, put their helmet down and ring it three times. And you could just see the dejection, just their face. It was just awful to watch. Um, so where I liked guys quitting when I was actually mm-hmm. in Bud's, in the surf zone, when I was out of Bud's, as the uh, the opso years and years later, fifteen plus years later, um, I, did, I hated to watch that because you right. could say, "Hey, this guy has he has the same dreams and aspirations that you probably had at that age, and now for whatever reason, he's decided not to continue on with the program." Um, so it's hard to see that. But then again, our instructors also know that, "Hey, when somebody quits, they." Com- turn into normal people, um, like our instructors. And they want to make sure that this person knows they can still go on to serve their country, take care of their family, yeah. do good things. And, you know, they don't want this kid going back and, you know, feeling dejected for the yeah. rest of his life or whatever. Bridge or something. Turn, turn into a positive. Like yeah. it's going to be hard enough anyway. So, right. you know, so much of life is turning yeah. those negatives into positives. What percent of people that make it through, do you think that they, that know they're going to make it through? Well, do, you, guess, do you think people that quit know they're going to quit before they even start? I don't know. I never, I never even thought about it. Um, so I just knew I was not going to quit because I've been telling all my friends since I was seven years old that <laughs> you I'm going to make it back, through. Yeah. So you're like, you know what? I'm going <laughs> to make no it. Because if I don't, like, yep. I'm never going to be able to live it down. Exactly. Everybody has known for so long. That's what I wanted to do. There was no way I could show my face again right. uh, had I not made it through. So it was either uh, I was going to either die or make it through. So, I had a guy right. in college that had uh, don't quit tattooed on his quads. Yeah, massive good reminder. Letters. Yeah. And... Uh, <laughs> this guy knew more about the seals than seals. Right. He knew everything. He quit day one. Didn't two or make three. it through boot camp. Oh. Oh wow. Yeah. That's yeah. rough. Swear to God. No. Yeah, I, I had a few of those guys I was in basic training with that already had like Ranger tabs tattooed on their shoulders. And you're like, oh. bro, I do not like. I don't know if that was a smart move, man. Like, I really don't think that was a good one. Yeah, I don't think no, that, was a good move. That, that should probably be disqualifying. Yeah. Out of the gate. Like My, guys had like um, they called them like drive on tabs and they're like the tabs right and you'd tuck them away somewhere like in a wallet or something like that and you'd be able to take it out and look at it i'm like i didn't blow i didn't i didn't have any of that shit i was like i don't want it i don't want to be distracted with any of this yeah leave me alone like just let me focus on this and uh like i i thought that was even sacrilegious to even have it oh yeah like it just felt like dude this is bad juju if i even have something yeah no tridents until you actually get it pounded into your chest my my Uh, brother's best friend showed up to a marine corps uh boot camp um with the marine corps hem tattooed across his back wow the full hem it's dedication oh, wow. entire back wow that's legit he's all they in beat his ass he went on to be honor grad he's a bad son but still is a badass but right. no, his last name in. is blow me wow. b-l-o-m-e wow that's interesting that's powerful that i made him tough so <laughs> <laughs> you go off you're at the team's What'd you do when you're when you're at the teams? Yep. So came in enlisted uh, right. because I, was my, I did that research and mm-hmm. uh, wanted to come in enlisted to essentially start in the mail room and work my way up. And once again, this is the uh, influence of popular culture and all those Vietnam movies that I saw as right. a kid. They always had that guy showing up, brand new officer, a little butter bar on, yeah. shows up in Vietnam, yeah. and you know tells the guys get a haircut, shave. We're gonna do this, and he leads them totally. right to an ambush every yeah. single time. Yeah. So I did not want to be that guy. So. Uh, I think I read uh, Rogue Warrior in 91 or 92, whenever that came out, and saw, oh, he started as an enlisted guy, uh, and then he became an officer. Uh, I'm like, what's the difference between those two? Like, I didn't know anything, right? Because you right. don't know back then. Um, and did my research and found out, hey, officers typically aren't snipers, and that's something I wanted to do, and really wanted to, to learn the trade, establish a reputation, and um, then decide later if I wanted to be an officer. Mm-hmm. So came in enlisted, and uh, was a communications guy, um, and ended up going to uh, to sniper school after my first platoon, because he 
didn't typically do it on the way to your SEAL team. You did it once you were already already there and proved that you were a good enough shot and had the right attitude and all that stuff. So did my first platoon pre-September 11th and then went to sniper school and started that next workup, started that next uh, deployment. And about two weeks into it was September 11th and we were already deployed at the time. So right. we were in Guam and uh, off we zipped to the, to the Middle East and we thought we were going to Afghanistan, but uh, we ended up taking over for, for team three and those guys ended up going to Afghanistan. Okay. We ended up doing the ship boardings in the Northern Arabian Gulf, which uh, right. before September 11th, were, uh, they were still exciting afterward, but it was a different, you want to just get in the fight, you want right. to get to Afghanistan. Um, so we didn't do that right away, but I uh, did the ship boardings, which was uh, really interesting to do for six oh, months. Because yeah. uh, it's like a cop pulling somebody over, I figured, mm -hmm. you don't know what you're walking up on. Right. When you climb those ships as they're heading towards Iranian waters and they've cut all the ladders off and they've sealed up uh, all, the, all the doors, soldered on the sheets of metal over them and strewn barbed wire everywhere to foul lines from uh, if you're going to fast rope on, right. um, like you get on that, you just don't know what you're walking up on. Yeah, yeah. So it was, uh, so it was pretty interesting. To, I'm glad I have that what, experience. What was the most interesting thing you uh, you found when you were doing those things? So it's the time to get on. So you have right. to get off if it hits international water or Iranian waters. You got to get off that thing. So you're right. gonna, you can't. You don't have too much time to figure it out. So uh, what we ended up doing was cutting us instead of trying to get in and get through an entire door, get through an entire window, and, and make entry. We just make a small hole and throw in some smoke, and then get them to come out. Smoke them out. Yeah. Yeah, because they didn't know what it was. I mean, it was just right. uh, you know fire in the. It was just it was just you know it was, wasn't even CS or anything. Right. Uh, but they don't know that. So um, so just it's just out thinking. So really that instead of just brute force, how do we just get on and take these guys down? Well, let's think this through a little bit. Um, and so just being able to adapt, uh, which came in handy, of course, later in Iraq and Afghanistan, as the enemy adapts yeah, to us. What was the most interesting thing you you ran into though? On the, on the ships. ships, it wasn't really that. Uh, nothing. Yeah, you no, didn't have like a, a what the oil. fuck moment or that a stuff. A lot of oil. Well, being when I'm traded on the black market, exactly. Yeah, and then they'd turn those same ships around, sell them off again, or auction them off, I think, and then they'd end up doing that same run again. Months what was later, the run? So. Like, what, what was the main run? Uh, out of Iraq with okay. oil, because the oil embargo from the UN right. was in place, and so they needed to get it off to get it out of there to sell it on the black market. So and where were they selling it? Else. In Iran or I don't know what would happen once it hits Iranian waters. Really, they had a few different conduits for getting it onto the into the world markets but i don't know that is super fucking interesting yeah so ace is an e5 on the yeah. bridge of one of these class three super tankers so those are the huge oil ones huge. that you see uh having to steer that thing turn it around back into you know get <laughs> away is... from iranian waters and into international waters using my little gps and right the, the compass on the like your the little garmin there. yeah like, like your 60 csx exactly. or whatever that is whatever it was back then <laughs> it was not that small one but it was like a bigger one but uh yeah ridiculous so do that you, was kind of fun do you remember yeah. the first ship you boarded uh, i think it was a dow a but i mean do you, you remember one. that that one? Yeah. Yeah, a little Dow. I don't think it ended up being anything. What's a Dow for those listening like really me that don't know? Small boat. Right. <laughs> small boat. Although I was in the Navy for 20 years, my uh, my boat nautical terminology is really not what it would be for somebody. You were in the Navy, but not really the water Navy. <laughs> exactly. Right? My, my, my uh, sea time is limited. <laughs> <laughs> By limited, I mean almost non-existent. Like non-existent. Yeah. But it, it sounds like you, some of the stuff you guys learned on the ships, you were able to transfer that into... Iraq and Afghanistan. Well, really just the mindset of it for yeah. me anyway, just trying to outthink it rather than Prime just the pump, force so it. So, um, and we were thinking, you know, we thought we were going to go downrange and if no one knew what was going on mm -hmm. in uh, 2001, 2002 time frame, like you thought you were going to go any, any second. Yeah. Um, so you're just, you know, prepping yourself mentally, physically, just getting ready for that fight. Um, but really it's, it's being able to adapt to the enemy faster than they're mm -hmm. adapting to, to yeah, you. Evan, you told a story about uh, like when y'all went in, like people had stuff painted on the doors of their Humvees. Like spray. yeah, like all, had, our, all our gun trucks had the standard. Like we had sub spray painted. Like and you had a question you know, mark. Everybody had like skulls and you know whatever. They had all this badass shit, and I just went around and spray painted question marks and all our shit. Like so you invented like, it. Didn't like, know yeah, what was gonna happen. I don't know. <laughs> and this one big. I one like day, it. And I put a I put an Amnesty International <laughs> sticker on on my truck. And the joke was we'd pull up and loud horn them. You know, like and they don't speak. English, but it was funny for me because I'm like, we're Amnesty International. We're just here to help. Uh, it was just an inside joke. <laughs> I'm I like laughing. it though. I thought it was funny. I thought it was being super funny. But <laughs> I wonder if they, they got it. I don't think they got it. <laughs> I don't think anybody got it but me. And I'm pretty sure that maybe a couple other guys, because I, because the, the guys on the team, like they were like, oh, you know, we want some like, you know, hatchet or, you know, 
whatever skull something and i'm like ah, i'm not gonna put any of that because it might be my skull i don't know <laughs> so, yeah, you definitely want to make sure it's the other guys yeah i've been a, i've been a I, i've been a firm believer in like um entering things with the uh what is it prepare for the worst hope for the best right where that's I'm it like, i don't know i don't know what's gonna happen that's it the contingency uh, planning right there yeah you know, it's all about uh, aggressive problem solving which is not that different from getting out it's just now i do it on the pages of a novel so that's what's really fun is we're not now, ready to go there yet yeah oh, so I, I got want, another seal question. You're going. You're so you go from you're an E5 invasion of Iraq. When did you go to OCS? Or uh, what, what so I had to decide. That? So I decided I had to decide in spring of 2001 okay. if I was going to OCS or not. Got it. And uh, I thought, oh man, at the time, yeah, there's not much going on in the world. Um, I had a really poor leadership in my right. uh, first two SEAL platoons. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, instead of complaining about it, I thought, well, I'll just, this is the time to go to OCS. This is the right. time to put in my package and see if I get accepted. And if I do, then really what I owe it to the guys rather than just complaining about it is to actually go. Right. Um, so decided before... September 11th and then September 11th happened and I was like, dang it, right? I should have stayed enlisted. But for someone who became an officer, the timing was pretty good, I must say, um, because September 11th happened, that deployment came back, did another little trip um, right after that, which was which was great. Went to OCS, three months of folding t-shirts and underwear because that somehow qualifies you to lead men into battle right. and then right back to the SEAL teams. So you don't, you don't have to go back to BUDS. You don't no. have to, so you're just basically... Now I'm an officer. Now I'm back in the teams. Right now they make. Now, at the time we did not have any sort of professional development at right. all. Now we have a, an officer training type program right. that they do uh, during buds. So after buds, before SEAL qualification training, the officers get pulled out of their class, and then they start up their SEAL qualification training with the class coming behind them. Got and it. During that time, they spend. I forget. It's a two months. In anyway, we have a couple couple months uh, of uh, officer training specific for them, and then they go to SEAL qualification training. So this is where we professionalized it a little bit, yeah. uh, but that was well after after my time. So I went right back to the teams. Right. Um, at the time, sometimes they would make you go to SEAL qualification training again as an officer, but because Why? I was so fresh. Um, get a chance at leadership before you do it okay. for real maybe but um for me for whatever reason they just grabbed me and mm -hmm. threw me in a in a platoon well there was some stuff going on it well was, did you go yeah, back to the same <laughs> team no what well, changed coasts okay so usually they do that um right. just so you're not uh leading the same guys yeah, you're drinking with sense. before yeah for sure uh, and for me it really wouldn't have made any difference it was right. a very natural transition mm -hmm. a very natural thing for me to do to move from enlisted so to, to officer you basically like you acted like an officer the entire time you were enlisted i think as like i was you... an officer i acted like i was enlisted <laughs> so it's, uh, which actually ended up working out for me <laughs> fairly well yeah. Uh, but yeah right back to the right back to the teams right into a platoon just on a different coast okay um but you're right reputation follows you. It's a very small community, right. as you know. And uh, yeah, I had a good run at, uh, at SEAL Team 2 on the East Coast. And it, as it was very busy then, so we were in the thick of it. Um, so probably my most uh, interesting deployments came during that time frame. Let me ask you this. Let me go back real quick. You said one of the things, you know, you wanted to be a SEAL and you wanted to be a writer. And then you mentioned a few minutes ago that you wanted to go, to, you want to be a sniper. And that was why you chose to go enlisted. Why? Why do you want to be a sniper? What'd yeah. you know about it? Or just well, it sounded cool? Yeah, no, growing up, re reading those books, reading uh, Carlos Hathcock's book. I think that's probably the first one I read. Long Train, uh, The White Feather. That's White Feather, yeah. yeah. And uh, mm -hmm. it's probably the first one that was a specific sniper nonfiction book that I read. Uh -huh. um, and, you know, it just always appealed to me for whatever reason. I liked uh, the thought of being out there kind of on your own. And, you know, if you're reading the Vietnam books, you're thinking about being advanced of, uh, of, of op forward operating lines um, and just kind of being on your own away from the flagpole. Uh, just all that stuff appealed to me. The field craft appealed to me. The right. shooting appealed to me. Uh, the problem solving, like all of it appealed to me. The small, even a smaller unit than your special operations unit, just being another piece of that, but even smaller. Like right. all that just just made sense to did, me. Um, did you have any background shooting growing up? Yeah, I shot growing up. Did you yeah. hunt growing up? I didn't hunt. I always wanted to hunt, uh, but this wasn't part of our, what our family did. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, but we went to the range and right. we shot. Uh, so, I, so I did grow up around guns and grew up shooting, but I didn't necessarily end up hunting until sniper sustainment training at Team 5, which was amazing. They took us to a, uh, I won't say the name of the, the place because I don't know if they advertise it, but a ranch up in Washington State. I know exactly where it is. Yeah. I've been up there several times. So, it's great. Awesome it's place. Awesome place. <laughs> great people. Yeah. Um, so I went up there in uh, 2000 
and uh, did my first hunt up there yeah. and had an amazing experience and was in. So from then on, um, got a little busy, uh, obviously doing a different kind of hunting mm-hmm. for the next uh, 11, 12 years. <laughs> different but, type uh, of hunting. but then when I got back from that last deployment to Iraq, it was, I knew it was time to get out. I knew it was time to start thinking about that transition and what I was going to do next in life. And then my kids were at an age, uh, the oldest one, where she wanted to start hunting naturally on her own. So we just dove all in and really, uh, since then, the only thing we've really eaten at home is wild game. Did you pick up shooting naturally? I mean, was it, was it tough? Was it complicated? Was it easy? Uh, the shoot, the stalking, I will say, cause I didn't have the hunting background. Right. The stalking was difficult for me. Moving shadows um, and staying in shoot, like well, that, just, yeah. and just not being super stressed about, uh, every single move that you would, you'd make. Cause it's a lot of, a lot of stress there, especially right. if you didn't grow up, uh, hunting and understanding how the dead space works and all that sort of thing. Um, but the shooting came, I guess, as much as it can come naturally. Mm-hmm. It's, yeah. uh, yeah, there's a picture of it yeah. right there. Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> nice. I want to go back up there. I want to bring it's my awesome. family up there. It's a fucking awesome yeah. place. That's yeah. a top secret photo for everyone, <laughs> for everyone that wants to know what it is. You, you'll never know. Mm. Um, yeah. Solid spot. So solid spot. shooting came naturally. Yeah, I'd say as naturally as it can work. come. Yeah. What about you with the shooting and stuff? I mean, I know your grandfather raised you as like, you were raised by like gay wolves running around the wilderness and shit, but. Shooting for I me, mean, was it natural for you? Like once you got yeah. in the mill and all that I stuff? I mean, I, because I started, they started me so young and we did so much of it. But really, I think we shot muzzleloader at, at, at uh, Black Powder Rendezvous, is what they're called. Nice. Growing up, one of my favorite Every summer stores. was nice. we would. Oh, I know it. And we would compete against each other. So my cousin was, we were six months apart. And then my other cousin was, uh, he was a year younger than us. So we had three guys basically but they're kids little boys were all competing against each other from a very very from the time that you knew that you wanted to beat your cousin which was basically the time that you can remember anything so whether it was throwing tomahawks or starting fires or shooting steel it doesn't matter like you wanted to win and it felt really especially it felt really fucking bad to lose and i remember my cousin danny uh he was way better at that shit than i was so i had to work But his dad was like a legit mountain man too. So he had a distinct training advantage. His dad was like a no shit, like old, great Vietnam vet, but like hand carved all his like muzzleloaders and like super legit dude. My dad was not like, uh, he wasn't like an over mountain man. He was a logger that liked to shoot, right? Whereas like the other person was hand hewning stocks and making barrels and doing all kinds of crazy shit. See, that's the family I wish I grew up in. That's the one I wanted my whole life. (laughs) It's that one right there. You and I both. My dad would be like, well, you can have fun once your work's over. Whereas like, (laughs) you know, my cousin, you know, down, down the street at my cousin's house, it was like, what are you guys doing today? Oh, my dad's teaching me how to tie flies. And then he's going to teach me how to like, you know, pound this piece of brass into a site and I'm going to dovetail it into the end of this muzzle loader. And you're like, get the fuck out of here, That's man. so like, awesome. Yeah. I'm over here picking was awesome. sticks in so the yard. Great. No, and between, I'm like, yeah, th- 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 between six or f- no, between fourth and fifth grade, I went to a camp and they had a survival class. So it was two right. camp and they had a former SF Vietnam guy looking back, Epic. like maybe he wasn't, I don't know. Probably. <laughs> <laughs> but at the time, I'm going to so still many. believe it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But, uh, and he taught survival and which was like, we got to build traps and yeah. you got to learn how to start a fire with one match type right. thing. You weren't actually doing the bow and drill. I, I did that later. I went to a little survival school. Uh, which bot, one? Boulder? Out, yeah. 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 Um, out in Utah? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Boulder Outdoor Survival School. Well, which one? Which one did you do? I did the week long. What yeah. the week long one yeah. was. Because they got like the Living three the week, the two week and one week. You did this yeah. as a kid or as like a SEAL? This I did before I went in the SEAL teams. Right. It's part of my part of my training, my own little yeah. workup that I did before so the, I went So your skill the set, teams. you learned how to box and do BJJ and and survival stuff. Yeah. Did any of that help him, buds? I think so. The mindset, particularly boxing and uh, jujitsu, yeah. um, and, and particularly with the people that I was doing jujitsu with at the time, um, just, I mean, it was early on. So, and really my skills plateaued there. I don't want to build this up like I'm a jujitsu guy. Right. Like, I think my, my skills plateaued early on, but early on, if you were going to get in a fight with somebody and they weren't in your class, like right. you were probably going to beat oh, that guy. Especially back right. in the nineties. Exactly. Early Oh 90s, dear God. Yeah. yeah Cause that's nobody the, knew, had even UFC, heard of it. UFC started then. in like 93, 94. Something. Really? Yeah. yeah. That, I think maybe was, even a little bit. I remember camp. my freshman year uh, in football right. in summer camp, uh, football college football camp. We, uh, I remember watching like the first UFC. And I, I was, it was, it was 94, 95. No, I remember, yeah. <clears throat> I remember that because, uh, cause Gracie, you were looking at this, even as a kid, you're like, you know, and watching Gracie. The guy's wearing pajamas. Fucking, yeah. Yeah. And you're like, 
this this dude's gonna get racked. Not, not and at like, yeah. it. So just awesome. gets, and you're like, how is this happening, right? Yep. And exactly. Uh, and that took like the world by storm. Yep. I think just this like because yep. you would look at these two people, and you're fascinated by this dude, and it was like he had a superpower. And that's really what, what yeah. kind of excited, I think, everybody. Because they're like, this dude just folded all these guys up. Yeah, yeah. Like he was Incredible. fighting against Chemo, who's like this big Hawaiian dude with like travel tats and a ponytail. Jack, you're like, God, this guy's going to kill this little Brazilian man. <laughs> yeah, and he yeah, just like, beat the you shit out of him. You should not get in the ring with that yeah. guy. Like, do not do <laughs> that. Throw the towel in. Take those yeah. pajamas off. He's yeah. going to grab him and like, throw what you. What yeah. suit are you wearing? Yeah. Like, what are you doing with that? Yeah. You don't and even know like, karate. Yeah. <laughs> Sir, how are you going to win? You know what? I want to watch, because you can still, I'm sure you can get any UFC or Right? Every like, single one of them, yeah. Dude, I would love to go back and watch that today because I haven't seen that. Because you remember that guy Tank? Oh, yeah. Tank Abbott. Tank yeah, Abbott. Tank Abbott. That guy had one. He was one trick pony. One. Hope to God that one trick <laughs> didn't yeah. land on your body. Hope <laughs> to God, right? Yeah. And I remember watching that fight going, this is fucking incredible, man. This dude has a superpower. Who is this Do guy? you remember when the Dutch kickboxer... Uh, kicked that big Samoan dude in the face and like his tooth flew across the ring. <laughs> <laughs> nice. No, no it's all, that all that stuff uh, helped, and all of it. Yeah. I think um, you know, built on the, the boxing, built on the Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, and vice versa, and then the backpacking and running, and any, you know, any sort of physical thing that I was doing right. back then kind of augmented the other. But what particularly state were you living in? It was Arizona. Okay. Yeah. But, he, but it's particularly the um, uh, jujitsu because I remember they would cycle people through and I was mm-hmm. uh, for the for the tests or whatever so you'd be just on the mat and as soon as somebody you were fighting got tired they'd be out fresh person in and now just you just keep fighting and so I, I still remember to this day that being one of the hardest things I've ever done is just right. to keep going uh, when the fresh people are coming in and, it, and that's all it is is a test of heart yeah so at my first day in BJJ uh, like official BJJ class was I don't know maybe a year ago I'm 5 10 235 pounds couple state records in powerlifting. Pretty no big strong. deal. No, no big deal. deal. Yeah. I mean, I'm not trying to name I, I had it. A guy, it's just like I got a couple no, no. records. Did I mention I had my state guy, records? I had a guy Evan's size, smaller than Evan, brown belt. He could have killed me 35 times in 45 minutes, and the part that drove me crazy was the some bitch's heart rate never went above 75 beats a minute on the high side. And I was like, well, I am a useless man. I'm a weak man. Well, unless you need this something sucks. moved. Unless huh? you need a big heavy object moved and well, come in yeah, handy. Manual yeah. labor poverty or something. You know, right. like, hey, the, the, the horse is laying today. We need somebody to pull the plow. Like, all right, See? man, I'll get out there. Well, that horse is dead. We need you to carry it away. Yeah. Right? But it's, no, but it's, that stuff's fascinating. And, and there's a confidence knowing that, you know, when you start doing that, I, 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 that totally makes sense now. Like yeah. having the confidence knowing that you know what you're doing out there. Yeah. And then it's distance running. Like as a kid, I would run and I lived in these Fun hills that. and I would <laughs> run these hills and I would, in cross country, yeah. we would win meets because we were in the hills and other people weren't they were in the flatland right. and flatlanders and, and westies yeah, just running those uh running those hills and i, I still remember to this day uh fifth sixth seventh grade which how hard running those hills were right so yeah, you, i remember you, i got i got into distance running later like when i was in high school and college and i would bang out 100 miles a week because that's what i would just do i would just Somewhere I, I I heard that this was like what you had to be good at in order to right. you know in no, order to, to exactly. graduate. So then I took that to like the next level. Yeah, you know, like like a you know an idiot. If with one's way good, too much, three or four must yeah, be better. A hundred must be yeah. good. And I remember like I would make bowls of oats, like not like the whole that, fucking bag. You know steel cut oats are just yeah yeah. Oatmeal. So I would, I would be in my I would be in my apartment. And I would make this like giant spaghetti bowl of oats. And then I'd like take honey because you're carving up, you know, Honey's delicious. Like, just, just squeezing the honey into it. And I'd take in probably like 3000 calories Carb just loading. like oats because <laughs> I'm like, well, I'm going to go out and run 20 miles, right. tomorrow, you know, Fuck and I'd protein. Be knocking those down. Oh, I wouldn't. I, w- I was like, no fat, like no fat in my diet. There's like carbs just all the stuff the now fucking it, yeah, yeah. It's, it's amazing yeah. how you skipped a heart attack I oh mean, dude like, <laughs> like but it was it was literally just the fact that i was running so much and i was burning it all off i mean obviously but i remember like that was so ridiculous but it's crazy but, today like i think they, they now like if they had the internet back then oh. and we could research and they had crossfit back then yeah. and we had all these all these people talking about nutrition and we knew more about Jeez. the fats and the different percentages and and all this stuff it's crazy that we still have that 80% of yeah, I, was just saying, I don't like, think it, it changed a damn thing. So crazy. Wouldn't change well, a damn thing. Everybody's in better shape, but um, I also have to wonder, you know, is it the right person that we're bringing in now? Right. Because there's just so much of a focus. There's like a celebrity status well, to was, some that are out there. I was sleep depriving I myself because like, I thought you could get 
better at it. Yeah, I thought you could get better at it. I, I knew, like, it I knew not to do horrible. that. horrible. I would set my alarm for like three o'clock in the morning and wake up and go run three hours and then go to class. Do stuff like that or go out and like me, throw a ruck on. And I would pack my ruck at night so this is the way, this is how crazy I was, like junior in college. Still crazy. I'd have a rock next to my bed. I had no, I had nothing in my room, by the way. So completely sterile. I like it. There was Spartan. nothing. We call that yeah. Spartan. I only had my workout objectives and my priorities that were postered on my wall. So then I would fill them out every day to include, you know, diet and regimen and everything else. Grades were like at the very bottom of all of this. <laughs> and I would set my alarm, get up at three, go pack my ruck at night with no lights because I needed to be super squared away. So everything had, I didn't know where everything was for time <laughs> and, then, and then go do it. Like ridiculous. Okay. So, I didn't do that. I, did I didn't. That. I did that's not do that's that. what I did in high school. I did put, remember those things that they used to sell in the back of black belt magazine or whatever. And they were like a canvas board. And back in the day they used to show karate guys oh, they yeah, oh, until yeah. their, their fists bled or their yeah. knuckles bled. So I put one of those next to my bed with a Chinese symbol that I don't know, probably said, or Japanese symbol probably says idiot, right. but it's whatever it said, it's two little symbols. And so I trained myself and my alarm would get up. I would wake up and I'd immediately hit that thing. <laughs> like I just woke up to hit as soon as I, as soon as I woke up, it's awesome. I did that all through high school, all through college. And, uh, I, I just broke that habit a couple of years ago. Seriously? Waking up, like, so if I was in a nap, and someone woke me up from a nap, I would immediately, I would immediately be bringing, bringing this arm up here to, try, to, to cover my jaw, and I'd be doing this. And so I just got out of that recently. Maybe so fucking greatest epic. seal story ever <laughs> fucking Seriously. told Seriously. in the history of the world. Yeah, it was fucking awesome. <laughs> Holy shit. Let me ask you this real quick. So Maybe a little weird. Were, yeah. there, were there guys in the Q course or in BUDS that didn't do the type of stuff that y'all did? Was Tons. there anyone that ever Tons. just came in off the street that I made know. it? Yep. <laughs> yeah, there were guys like, dude, I was doing all this crazy shit. I didn't wear socks. I didn't wear, fuck, man. Like, I didn't wear socks for like a decade because I thought my feet were supposed to be hard. <laughs> I didn't wear socks. I didn't wear underwear. I'd be sleep deprived. I'd run all the fucking time. Like, hey, I'm surprised I didn't like. You weren't punching the board though, bro. No. I, I'm, <laughs> you didn't I mean, take it to the next level. That's next right. level <laughs> shit. Like, that's like punching the board. But I'd show up and I'm like. I'm doing all this crazy shit and some fucking dude would show up and be like, well, how'd you train for this? I didn't fucking train for this. Yeah, someone said, I found out what seals were in boot camp. Like that one. I'm like, are you kidding me? I've been training since I was seven years old, (laughs) solely focused on this. And you didn't do anything and you just found out about it in boot camp and then you just showed up and passed? Like what? And some of those guys uh, go on to be great seals. That's like JT, how JT got into uh, the JTAC world is he was in uh, Air Force boot camp, whatever it's called. And um, some dude like walked up and was like, called out six names and like those guys, they were like in another room and JT's like, yeah, that's a mm-hmm. six. And he goes, do we get to use lasers? And the guy's like, absolutely. He goes, all right, we're going with you. JT what? had no fucking clue what any of that was. I remember talking to a dude and he was like, oh yeah, I, I didn't even know about this. I, I just didn't want to go to Korea. So I put it in my pack. <laughs> nice. Like, fuck you, man. Yeah, it's interesting how the military does that fuck sometimes. You. Let's, let's talk more about the punching of the thing. Um, <laughs> when's the last time, when is the last time you got up and punched something just it, it, hold on. It wasn't that Not long out of ago. instinct, but out of out of the desire to train. Like, hey, if I, I'm gonna get, I'm gonna punch this fucking thing. I'm gonna be ready. I think college was the last time I actually had the board, but, right. but it stayed with me for a long time because those are formative years, yeah, right yeah. there. And then you're solely focused on it. And yeah. I remain solely focused on on well that job really for the last twenty. But the punching the board thing, I, I mean, I did that up until very recently. Just the the instinct stayed with me for a long, long time. Um, but you, now I think it's gone. So you like got up and punched no, your wife. Gone. Is that what happened? I, I did not actually punch because I'd always go like like <laughs> like that. Like I like for years it was just like this, and then I would stop right, right about there but i always came like this right up there to the to the jaw with the left hand and ready to throw some the, hollywood throw asshole right. is listening to this right now and is going to factor dude, that, that into a seal movie dude i think it's good for mindset actually i because like yeah i, I don't need to do it, it my whole life, good for your cortisol levels I mean, and you're gonna have a fucking heart attack it worked yeah it worked you made it i made it congratulations it thank it you i appreciate that yeah. <laughs> it might have been the one thing that got you through you never know you never know. Uh, I think really it was just the shame of coming home, not right. having passed. It's really what made it through. I probably, probably didn't need to punch I, the board. I, I already had a plan for that. I was just going to disappear, maybe change my name. That's like, a good plan. I don't know. I was just yeah, gonna, like, solid. Disappear. <laughs> like, just like, yeah, I'm never showing my face back there ever again. Exactly. You just got to start over. Just like, got to start, start over. new. Yeah. Just start over. My new name's going to be Ethan, you know, going to be an or- 
organic farmer. I'm just about peace. You know, yeah, something like that. Not I don't many options left. I've got a handful of buddies that um that they will attribute the reason they made it to buds, made it through buds, was the fear of having to go and be in the fleet and live on a ship for four years. Yeah, I mean, I can more imagine telling that's my friends I didn't make yeah. it, but yeah, the the ship is definitely not something you because they said you want to go uh, Navy. It's boot, you call it boot camp, right? Yeah. So they, I mean, they said in boot camp you learn how to live on a ship and fold stuff and put it in a little drawer and stuff, and they were just like, seriously, if I well, just like OCS, yeah, folding clothes and folding how to live on a ship because most folding. of the Navy is on a ship. I mean, and and they were like the thought of of failing. Is hey. one thing, but the thought of having to fail and then go live on a ship for four years, yeah. I'm going to I'm going to Canada or Mexico. Haze gray and underway. That's it. You know? That's it. It's so different life. That's the life we live. Yeah. I, I mean everybody has their has their thing. Yeah. yeah. Everyone has their El Guapo. So let let Baker stop talking for a while because I want to transition into um I'm entertaining you. You are you're you're getting ready to get out. How many years you got in? Well, as I'm getting ready to get out, yeah. I have about um, at 17 years or so. And okay. Really during that last year, though, is the one right. where I'm like, okay, now it's time, it's time to really put some thought into this and figure out my next move. And I've always wanted to, to write. I so you to knew this. that's what you were going to do. Yeah. So you didn't fuck around. That's that's exactly what you're going to do. That's Had it. Had you been writing stuff uh, at all to the lead up? No, no, I hadn't been practicing at all. Um, but what did transition over was all the study I did on insurgencies, counterinsurgencies, oh, yeah. terrorism, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, Islam, yeah. where we were going in the world, lessons right. learned, like all the stuff I was doing for the job. Yeah. Um, because that's what I felt I owed the guys yeah. under my command was to do, you know, do, the, do all that. Any spare time I had was spent mm -hmm. training, whether it was my body or my mind, right. um, because I felt I owed that to them, to their families, to the country, to the right. mission. Um, and then all that stuff really transitioned over to the, to the novels because it's right. a political military thriller uh, so it was the second one mm -hmm. and so all that stuff uh, I do I do fact check uh, because over time you know memory fades and all that but I have yeah. that back there I have all that training I have all that study mm -hmm. in my head and now I just put it work it in to the storyline of a fictional narrative but did you formulate storylines though I mean you don't you know maybe not writing but you didn't think about oh this would be a good book this would be a good idea none of that nope during my last year I wrote down uh, when, when it's time to get out of the military mm -hmm. uh, and you kind of go in a separate section and drop your papers as an yeah. officer and they're like okay uh you're not one of us anymore now your job is to really get out of the military it's like a super cool place with like really shiny yeah. silverware and like everybody's like pretentious and well a no one different knows. place where the officers go well I, actually it's I where everybody else goes <laughs> okay. yeah no it's where everybody else goes right. and you just have to go through your classes and right. get everything signed and do all your physicals and all that stuff but essentially you're off the radar right um so it's during that time that i started writing and i wrote down i think five or six different ideas for stories and wrote them all down and then i picked the one i thought was going to be the most hard-hitting the most visceral mm. uh the most primal right out of the gate because i wanted the one that was most likely to get published and that was and terminal that list. was terminal list yeah okay. yeah so i wrote i had wrote the plot first okay and then the, the title came super uh, right after as soon as i saw right. just the the little outline synopsis i said okay terminal list it just came mm -hmm. to my head um and then started writing and I, yeah so so, so tell us tell us about the story without giving it away yeah so it's uh you know it's it it's a political military thriller like a Brad Thor, mm -hmm. Vince Flynn, Nelson DeMille, Stephen Hunter that kind of uh political military thriller and what always appealed to me growing up in both books and movies was that theme of revenge. It's like an age old theme that brings us really back to the fire yeah. around the campfire, um, uh, defense of tribe, providing for family, providing for the tribe. I wanted something that would tap into that for people psychologically. So right. I knew that, Hey, this is going to be a story of revenge. And then I thought, well, how do you make it a story of revenge without constraint? Um, quote unquote, uh, meaning that there's a lot of those stories out there that where the guy has nothing left to lose. Mm -hmm. And I thought of how Japanese samurai used to go into battle thinking they were already dead right. and how that made them more effective and efficient warriors on the battlefield. Mm -hmm. I picked that up somewhere along the way. And I said, how do you translate that to a modern warrior where someone has a background that's similar to mine? Um, how do we do that? And so uh, that's where I brought in a conspiracy that I got from um, studying the church hearings in the late 70s where some... The, French, the Frank Church. Yep. The, that's it. The center. Yeah, the, the center of Frank Church hearings is what you're referring to, which is yep. extremely interesting when you dive down the fucking rabbit hole on that it's where the family jewels were came that's where they came out this is like an incredible time in american history just yep. a caveat to that no no absolutely and it's uh so what's, more broadly what's it called one more time? uh the church hearings the church they had, i think they had an yeah. official name but they're known by the church hearings if you google it yeah. um but really what it did you know, br more broadly is it uncovered some um some overreaches i'll say by different 
agencies of the federal government. Um, yeah, so William Colby, I think, was a director at the time, or uh, I'm yeah, not sure. so Colby was a director. And so some interesting facts behind all of this, which is super cool that you, because I, I love this time in history, which is you know, they, they started deep diving into what the agency was, was really up to. They realized that uh, the United States population didn't really have a great insight into what was happening within the intelligence community. And the executive office had a ton of fucking power. Not only that, it wasn't necessarily the, the, uh, the executive office. It was the director of the agency. Um, I'm just, I'll, yeah. I'll characterize some of, some of this. And then, but Colby was actually the last director uh, of the agency that came from the agency. Okay. So post that was, uh, they, they replaced him with H.W. Uh, uh, Bush basically came in right after that. So Bush was a Nixon appointee. Uh, no, he came in, Bush came in as a Nixon into the White House under Nixon, he came into the agency much later. But uh, there's some really fucking fascinating, fascinating history around the agency at that time. So this is super cool that you put yeah. this in. And you're you're that, a huge Bush fan, like H W. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. I, he would classify it as overreaching. I would classify it as the most fun you could probably ever have had as an agent in the federal government. Probably in, true in, in the United States, like from 1946 to. <laughs> 1973 or 1978 <laughs> you would have been a fucking rock star like if you got into the right place at the right time amazing yeah, you but could do amazing you, things back, back yeah. then today just look at that news today so we have the saudi arabia the yeah. guy walking to the end so yeah. all that stuff with all with cameras everywhere yeah. it's changed the game things you could get away with even 10 years ago you can't get away with today can't get away with them and you can they just have to be got to adapt yeah your tradecraft has to evolve right yep, so the problem exactly. with government bureaucracies is that tradecraft doesn't evolve because they're institutions that are governed and doctrine is hard to shift so that's just my own two cents no, that's why the enemy this, did so well against us in iraq and afghanistan and continues mm -hmm. to do so well against us is because they can adapt outside the constraints of a gigantic bureaucracy that's why startups are effective against large corporations black but, rifle coffee yeah, black rifle coffee black rifle coffee is actually in the book which it i is. thought was fucking super yeah. cool yeah so keep going because yeah, i yeah. think this is super interesting so you wrap yeah, it so, up so yeah i wanted to uh to figure out a way that the protagonist of the story named james reese right. how he would think how do you make a guy think that he's James already dead Reese. where James did you Reese. come up with that name did you that, just pull it out of your fucking ass or? that's gonna remain classified okay cool yeah got it but uh because so i know a guy named jimmy reese <laughs> you know someone else told me that recently too <laughs> he's, a cat guy. Army guy. he's yeah. a cat guy he's and a cat guy i had no dude. idea i had no <laughs> yeah, idea when i yeah. came up with it but jimmy i do reese i do is now a great dude and he's got a great name yeah and uh so i figured how do you do this how do you make that how to take that uh going into battle thinking they're already dead from from samurai times to today um and so that's when i came up with the with the study of the church hearings and some of the things that the agency and other elements of the federal government had done in testing things on our on nation oh, soldiers yeah. on yeah, yeah. on prisoners uh and people in mental institutions hospitals um college students um and then a bunch of rules out of the church hearings mm -hmm. there was a bunch of rules that came down that says yeah. you can't really do that anymore yeah. um, congressional oversight it, yeah. Exactly, yeah. Uh, re into review boards mm -hmm. and all this sort of thing. So I say, hey, what if we? Uh, what if it's been enough time has passed since then, where there is a a private sector slash um, government conspiracy to test some drugs on our nation's most elite soldiers, some beta blocker type right. stuff? And what if it goes wrong, and they need to to get rid of all evidence that they that they did this testing without the consent of these soldiers? Right. Um, so that's where where the side effects of these drugs affects this seal seal troop. Right. And uh, he thinks he's dying. So that's not giving too much away. I don't want to. Yeah, I'm trying to. I'm trying gotta, to, uh, to frame that, it. Because yeah. people are they like they're 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 going to want to they're going to want to either download it or they're going to want to purchase it for sure. So point being, he's yeah. going into this new battle thinking he's already dead. Mm -hmm. um, this conspiracy takes his troop on the battlefield, his family on the home front, and uh, he, he comes up with this list called the terminal list as he unravels this conspiracy, putting people on his list. And then he essentially becomes the insurgent that he'd been fighting for the last 16 years. Right. So he takes what worked against us in Iraq and Afghanistan, brings that to home soil as he works his way up his list to the highest levels of the uh, federal government, putting people in the ground. Mm. That sounds great. Thank you. I'm yeah. excited. I'm excited too. 
And thanks for listening. We're all going to go read the book. Uh, we're going to go read the book. Okay, so, but this is just number one. This is number one. Uh, this is number one. When's number two come out? Second one is April 2nd of okay. next year. Yeah, yeah. And I uh, just did another, another book deal with Simon & Schuster, so there's at okay. least two more in the pipe, and I started working on number three last week, so, oh, and I'm super shit. excited about that one. Yeah. Number three, so number two's done. Number two is essentially done. It'll be in edits from now until late November, early December. Right. Um, but so at the same time, you're working on a new book while you're editing the old one. So it's just right. kind of how this one book a year cycle works. How much would you say you improved from book one to book two? So it's different. Uh, and I wanted to not just do a, uh, a carbon copy of book number one and book number two and change locations and change conspiracy or whatever. I needed to do something that elevated it to a new level. Mm -hmm. And this has been just out of the gate has been just an amazing experience. And I love every part of this writing process. You and enjoy the process. I love the process. Wow. And I love learning new things about publishing. And I love every single part of it, creating it and then uh, editing it and just learning about this industry as I go along and getting better at, at certain things, understanding the marketing. Because essentially, uh, I look at this, yes, I'm an author, but I'm also an entrepreneur because you have to be. Uh, yeah. You're your own, uh, I mean, you're doing your own marketing, you're building a business essentially from the ground up when you're starting off as a debut author. I mean, you don't have to, but I think to be commercially successful and to be able to get the word out, you have to be able to leverage things that uh, maybe you couldn't 20, 30 years ago, but today are available to you. Uh, social media and staying up with all that sort of thing mm. and figuring out how to map that land space, understand it. Uh, and for me, who I never did anything there other than know to stay away from it in the right. military because of how the enemy could exploit yeah. that. Yeah. Um, I'm stepping into a whole new world, a whole new landscape. And, and I love that because I love learning new things. It's what I loved about the SEAL teams. I was learning something new there every day, um, adapting to the enemy, studying, and then learning things from guys in the platoon and the troop because you have people coming from all these different walks of life uh, in the SEAL teams from people inner city people uh you have people from the middle of the country they've never seen the ocean before you have road scholars that are coming in as enlisted guys right. you have this just people coming from all these different backgrounds which i think also made us uh, uh stronger and able to um to adapt better on the battlefield because you have so many people from these different backgrounds how long did it take you to write this book about a little over a year and then how long did it take you to write the second book and then well you're definitely so the first one a year and then about six months of editing yeah so let's say that's about what ross said with his books he said the first right. one was about a year because you understand the process more and you know shortcuts and all that stuff. Right. Right? And the second one, so I already started the second one before I even submitted this to Simon & Schuster because there's so many examples of people whose first book don't make it um, and their second one knocks it out of the park. Right. So John Grisham, he wrote A Time to Kill First and couldn't Such give that book writer. away. Yeah. And then he wrote The Firm and then that's the one that, that took off and has the movie and all that. And from then on, it's Pelican Brief and yeah. Client. I think and I've read that. pretty much every book he's ever and written. Great, but yeah. I, I think his best one is that one that out of the gate didn't right. quite make it a time to kill yeah. i love that book. hands down time to kill is yeah. amazing yeah and then yeah. uh term limits with vince flynn same thing right. so um he, well, he self-published that one well you know who the, there's the author that's actually i think everything he's ever written is a home run is cormac mccarthy all the pretty horses no country for old men blood meridian yep. I mean, that guy. and that's a different guy I'd throw him into the literary column yeah. right. this would go in the uh commercial fiction political right. thriller yeah. type right type thing so it's a i mean i read his stuff and a lot of people read both but i think it's definitely so you can do that and be a little more reclusive but for this commercial fiction if you want yeah. this to be a success you've got to map that land space you, you've got to are build you happy business. with the finished product here on this i love it absolutely yeah. really? i got it to as good as that's it could possibly be ass, and then sent it off to to simon and schuster well and you've got brad thor he reviewed it you've got uh steve barry who's steve barry an author okay yeah great guy yeah. such a great guy uh chris cox nra chuck norris chuck norris baby how in the hell did you get chuck norris i know crazy right? chuck norris facetimed me out of the blue a uh, about two years ago i guess it would be now like how did he facetime you out of the blue dude? so a friend of mine was uh <laughs> <laughs> so i guess it wasn't really out of the blue right. uh, a friend was at his uh, at his ranch and uh He's told him about me and and uh, that i was such a fan growing up you know i mean who didn't love the delta force yeah, lone wolf on. mcquade yeah, i mean yeah. i love that stuff right Silver and, and, uh, and stuff. he, yeah. <laughs> he mm -hmm. facetime me so all of a sudden chuck norris is there on my uh on my facetime just that's badass, awesome dude. yeah and so we do you got have his phone and, number uh i don't think i have yeah that's number. what i would say to yeah. me too <laughs> <laughs> totally say that. but could not have been nicer could not have been more amazing and right. blurb the book and uh, took a picture with it and just just such a good guy such an a good extremely guy. unique thriller absolutely mm. intense bam that's what chuck norris said bam you've yeah. got since Jack Carr is a former Navy SEAL, you would expect accuracy, intensity, a battle wisdom from his first novel, The Terminalist. What you might, what you might not expect 
is Cracker Jack plotting vivid characters both in in and out of uniform in a relentless pace worthy to finish. It's a great start. Stephen Hunter. Bam. Stephen or Stephen? Stephen. Okay. He who is a great guy. Mm-hmm. Uh, I've read. He's probably the best guy as far as in writing, writing really? these kind of thrillers today. Okay. Um, just uh, he wrote uh, Point of Impact, mm-hmm. which came out in the early '90s, and they made the movie Shooter out of it. Oh yeah, that's yeah. Bob Lee yeah. Swagger series. So gotcha. That's who Stephen Hunter is, and he doesn't do the social media thing, doesn't do the mm-hmm. marketing thing. He just writes incredible novels, and he's become a uh, we haven't met yet in person, but because of you know the modern mediums of communication, you can really develop a relationship with somebody, and right. uh, he's been so nice to me. Um, that's just such a great guy like a bullet from jack carr's custom built sniper rifle the story arrives on target with devastating impact trust me you won't be able to put this one down mark owen yeah that's it so who really shot bin laden then because i mean if i was not there right (laughs) i will say i was not there you weren't there no but you know who's going to be on here in the next couple weeks is um o'neill Okay. Yeah, he's coming out in the next couple of weeks. Yeah, I do not. Uh, I do not know him, and I'm you sifting don't? through my phone here because. Are you trying to find Chuck Norris? I am not trying Come to find on. Chuck Norris. I'm going to look. At, do it for, for Evan. something. He does so much for people. Give him something. We can for... send. We can send Chuck some black rifle. Oh, coffee. that'd be great. Would you like dude. to do that? That we'll would send be him a, epic. Yeah, yeah, we'll send him a, uh, a little care package. Yeah, that'd be awesome. Yeah, because I mean, he's the I first. Mean, it's Chuck Norris. Norris. He's the first guy to ever serve in Delta and SEAL Team Six at the same right. time. How did? How did he pull that off? I don't know. So, what do you think? Do you think they're going to turn this thing into a movie? I think they might. Yeah. I think they might. I'd love to be able to announce something on this show today. But, right. But um, I've been sworn to secrecy, Have so you? I'm not allowed. But And plus, I want the person who optioned it to, right. um, to be able to uh, kind of have a, a clean slate when he announces it. So. so when he does announce it, let's announce it here. We'll, we'll follow suit. We'll push it out for you. That's for sure. Uh, Everybody, this is Jack Carr. Where do they find you on social media? All right. So there's a few things, which is why I was Please. just looking at my yeah, phone. Pull right that up now. before we wrap, um, before we wrap. So I was just told to do this. This is a okay. new thing. This is part of my uh, education in mm-hmm. marketing and social media landscape and all that stuff. So people can text four four two two two. Four four two 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 four four two two two. Yep. On their phones, yep. And then it'll pop back up a little message Shut from me. Up. Seriously, yeah, let's see if it works. Let's test I'm gonna it. I'm going to do it right now. Yep, test it out. This will be the first time this has ever been announced. And my publicist will be very happy that I actually remembered. Four four two two two. Yep. Let's see what happens. Just got a dick pic. That's weird. <laughs> That's it. That's weird. <laughs> That's it. So it's supposed four, to come up. Four two two two. Four four two two two. Okay. Yep. Yep. And then you can reply with your email. Right. Which puts you on the team. Oh shit. Yep. yep. So, I got nothing back. Oh, come on. Baker, you try it. Try it. Are you on airplane mode? No. 4422. Two, two, got two. it. Yep. You got it? Did it work? Yep. Damn, Did Evan just really? mess it up? 44222. Two, two. That's it. No, I screwed it up. I got lead digit identifier not recognized. Oh, man. All right. We'll have to edit this out then. Oh, yeah. Lead digit identifier not recognized. We're, Dave, we're going to have to. We're going to have to. We are going to have to edit this one. Oh, bummer. Worked on mine, man. Did it really? Yeah. Well, the other day when I tested it. So yeah. So let's cut. Start over. Where can we? Well, first we'll we'll start over at another piece, which is got it. I did it right. It worked. How do you? How did you do it? Did it? So what you do is you text four four two two two, and you just say anything, and they'll respond and say hello. Please reply with a text containing only your email address, so we can send you everything we promised. Thanks. Is that what it says? Yep. It's supposed to but say. But you have to you have to text it again. So there's no. It says you're supposed to say good copy. Please reply with a text containing only your email address for special access. Hmm. Oh, thank you for opting hmm. in. Reply yeah, there you go. Did it work? So it only works sometimes. Okay. I'm gonna try so this. I'm gonna try this. Try that. Try it again. Let's see. Dave, Bam. you try it. We're all trying it. Everyone yeah. try it in the room. Four four two two two. Yours just Dave. put a little hyphen in there. Mine didn't have a little hyphen. Mine put up. a hyphen. I think so. It screwed it up. Yeah, mine didn't. Oh, do that. is that what's going on? Yeah. So mine just showed up as a four four two two two, but no, there was no hyphen. But you I didn't have, have an to iPhone, do or do you have one of those other weird phones? I have an iPhone. Okay. Yeah. Dave, let us know what you think. Yeah. Okay. 
So four four two 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 no hyphens. No, but y'all are both comms guys, right? I can't do that. Y'all are both comms guys, right? Yeah, it doesn't work. Sunspots it does it automatically. Sunspots, sir. I was a comms guy too. So hey, so the interesting thing is, who put us together was Tom Davin. Yep. So Tom has been on the show. Uh, he uh, incredible guy, former Force Recon guy, former CEO of Five Eleven. Awesome dude. I was just down in um, at Clever Talks with Tom. Oh, nice. Yeah, it was good. Nice. Is that so, the San Diego one? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So we went down there and spoke. Tom's so great. He's what a great story. What a smart guy. Great friend. Great mentor. Man. And uh, things he did with Five Eleven is amazing. Well, yeah, he has a track record of success. We'll yes. say that. Yeah, a, a lifetime of success and achievement. Then we met officially face to face, which I think is kind of a funny story because. Uh, we met for the first time at Performance Archery in San Diego. Yeah. You made yeah. me a great cup of coffee. <laughs> I did. And I appreciate I it. I did. And we yeah. did it again here. No, yeah. but that was a yeah, a great, great experience out there. We met up with Jocko and, mm -hmm. and Rogan and John Dudley and Andy Stump and Dude. John Barclow. And we had a solid crew out there at Performance Archery. It was awesome. a fun time. Fun, it was, great it was weekend. Super cool. Like that entire weekend was awesome. Uh, how's your, that, that's, a, that's the thing I was going to ask you. How's your archery stuff? All right. Well, since yeah. I saw you, I have not shot the bow as much as Damn I it. should. Right. Which is why I hunted with the rifle this year. But you got your dry fire mechanism. So, right? well, I got my knock to it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I got my knock to it. Right. I only got the dry fire trainer, you're right. Yeah, the yeah. Dry I love fire that, trainer. and I've been doing that a lot because it's easy to travel with, and it's uh, it kind of relaxes me. Same thing. Uh, I do the same thing. Yeah. So, you know, you know what I did on mine? Uh, where that... Where that knot is on the top, I actually burned the knot in, so I focused that as my sight. Ah, so it okay. gives me a sight at the top of that knot. Nice. It actually gives me something to aim at. So just like doing uh, steady drills on dry firing with a pistol or whatever, if your sight's moving. So I'll, I've got a spot on my wall in my office at home, nice. and then I've got that, and then I'll line them up, and then I'll pull. Ah. So I'll be pulling tension against each other yep. to see how much movement there is. Ooh, I like that. I, it was good, man. It was, it was, next, a, it was a good level. next level for me. I liked it a lot. Did John Dudley knock on TV tell you to do that? Because he no. neglected to mention that to me. He didn't. I I used to do that with dot drills all the time. Got dry it. fire dry fire stuff. pistol. Awesome. So I just was like, this is dry fire and pistol. It's just for a bow. So I need to see how much movement there is. And ultimately I want that to move, but I want it to move straight forward, right? Okay. I don't want it to come off at an angle. So that was the one thing that I was, I was concentrating on the last couple of months. No, I love it. And I love that knock to it release. That is Dude, the way to go. Um, yeah. The, so for people that are listening that shoot bows, I happen to be a, a, a bow yeah. guy. The, what are you what are you talking about the dry fire like the the, the cord thing? i don't know what yeah what is that called okay because yeah. i don't so, want people yeah. going home and pulling their bows out and fucking oh god dry don't firing. try fire your fucking bow no <laughs> and, no and also a good thing to do when you travel with your bow and i learned this from that weekend at performance right. archery is to zip tie your strings together yes. on your bow yeah. so that if somebody at tsa opens it and says oh look at this look at this and then Pang. they pull it back and let it go because they don't know what they're doing yeah. well now they can't do that if you See, have a zip tie around there god damn so, it man now i've, I've that's I've, yeah i have traveled all over the world with my bow i've never had the first piece of problem with it See? and now, now you, gotta, you put the juju you put the albatross around so my you neck better, i gotta yeah. i gotta i'm gonna start doing you better that. zip tie it better zip yeah. tie it but, but yeah the knock to the trainer uh yeah i forget what it's called but it's on john dudley's website yeah, it's so the, a different uh, company it's the thing i think pulls, makes it's it. a string that pulls back yeah okay so. yeah but it's on his website and yeah. products or gear yeah. and uh Great knock thing. to it is the release and yeah. then the, the trainer i think is called the yeah. trainer and yeah it's really yeah. cool a piece yeah. of wood and some string it's uh it's awesome uh and you you don't have any more hunts this year uh, what do I have? You got a rifle well, hut next month, right? I'm headed, I'm, uh, well, I'm heading to Africa in uh, a couple oh, weeks. Go every year. And I'm going Where? to train. I'm going to South Africa and help train up an anti poaching unit. Hell out there. yes. So, when is that? Um, that is in two weeks. Really? Yeah. God. Is that like for fun or are you recreationally so it's both. doing So that? the second novel starts, I don't want to give too much away, yeah. but it starts with an anti-poaching type theme in Africa, in okay. Mozambique. And I went to Mozambique while, before I'd even submitted this book to uh, Simon & Schuster and I was right. doing research out there. I was taking pictures of the ground, the rocks, the foliage, like just right. to get get a sense of what it was like out there, talking to the people. Um, so I incorporated that all into book number two. And we did some anti-poaching stuff out there at the time, but this is a specific trip just to do the anti poaching stuff nice. so it's m4s and glocks right. are what the uh, anti-poaching unit has out there so um, a marine buddy um, is actually heading it up right and then i'm kind of there 
here to I'm just going to be helping in out. Mozambique. In uh, we went to South Africa this oh, time. Right. Yeah, okay. So, yeah. So well, it's South Africa is super safe. So you're gonna have a great trip there. Like it's like it's. I think as you stay out of the cities, you're, you're yeah, pretty yeah, good. Right? The, the, yeah. yeah, there's a I, lot going on in South Africa. Africa. I go every year. I go every summer. Nice. Yeah, I nice. went to uh, Botswana like a decade ago, and I trained their uh, counter poaching guys just actually oh, nice. just south of the Okavango, okay. and it was an epic trip. It was it was just me for the most part. Oh wow! So it was okay. With, uh, with a couple companies of Botswana and uh, Defense Force guys, it was like. It was great. It was a great trip, man. Like, yeah, no, I'm looking forward there. to it. And then I'll be able to talk about it as right. someone, not just someone who's read about it. And I had a little experience in Mozambique, but to right. actually go there and have the sole focus of the trip being to train up these guys yeah. and evaluate how they are right now and just mm -hmm. see what we can add, see if we can yep. make them a little better. And then I'm going to be there learning at the same time That's and awesome. uh, incorporating whatever I, what I get into future novels. That's rad, dude. That's cool. That's yeah. really freaking cool, man. I'm jealous. Very jealous. So check out Jack Carr. Uh, where do they find you on social? So you can find me on officialjackcar.com. Okay. And that's the website. So people that really want to do more of a deep dive yeah. into the weapons, uh, I think some stuff on there on M4, on the sniper weapon systems, right. on some of the knives, some of the things used in the book. Um, the evolution of the cover is also something I talk about. On oh, really? There, how that nice. comes about and how you work with a publisher on that. Um, so more of a deep dive on the website. And then I'm on social media at Jack Car USA on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. But Facebook, I don't do anything. Uh, people, I think they, I have someone that just puts up ads and stuff on there right but to really to uh, uh twitter and instagram are the two that i uh do myself right. and that i interact with people on and get to and i really like being able to thank people that uh th that have gone out and enjoyed the novel and reach out on social media and tell me that they like this part or that part or this part really spoke to them um because really yeah it's a novel of fiction but the emotions that the protagonist feels are all real emotions that I right. felt at some point over the last 20 years. So I just right. take those and I twist them into a fictional narrative. Um, so being able to interact with people on Twitter and Instagram primarily, um, I really do enjoy doing that and having a platform to thank everybody that's uh, helped me along this journey. So that's cool. it, it's, uh, it, it's, epic, it's, man. it's fun. So grab the book, make some black rifle coffee and uh, sit down for a hell of a ride. It, just in, as a reminder, just a caveat guys, like this is, like Jack didn't pay us for this. Like this is a, this is a true endorsement based on, uh, we truly respect his past, what he's doing today, uh, who he is. So, uh, we, we do not do like paid endorsements for launch code. This isn't a thing like we're, we're not doing any marketing out here for this. It's, uh, just an endorsement of the man, his transition. And we love to just provide value through Epic people. He is fucking one of them. So get out, uh, check out the book, leave a review on Amazon because I know that helps quite a bit. It does. Uh, and follow him on social media because he's a fucking rad dude. Thank you so much for having me. It's, mm -hmm. uh, it's been a pleasure and an honor to be here. Cheers. Cheers. Let's get some more, let's get some more coffee. You guys get know where I can get a good some. cup? 